Georgia versus South Carolina. And then you had hip hop and all the rest of the arts. And you had commercial versus fine arts. So there was the, we were able to identify a lot of those divisions. Um, even there was an element of have and have nots. Um, another important issue was youth involvement. And we see this on First Friday a lot. You got a lot, particularly African American kids, they're running up and down the street with nothing to do. Because they can't go to the bars, and there's really nothing to engage the young people um, and get them involved in the arts, you know, independent of school and some in church. But how do we, as the arts leaders, get more of the young people involved on a consistent, continual basis? And there's some other issues, but I race, of course, came up. Um, how come enough black people aren't going to the symphony? How come enough white people aren't going to the best of anything? You know, so and that dynamic came up as well. So, um, but what I'll start, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, starting on this first one is Harrison Hickman. And I'll let them introduce themselves when we, when we start. Um, this is Brenda Barato. We've got Michael Hicks. Saffron Kelly. Or Jessica, Jessica Baptiste. <laughs> Saffron <laughs> Kelly's her pen name. She's an author. So. Okay. Um, Jezebel Knott. Did I get it right? Yeah. Very good. Joey Trainer. We got Cindy O'Brien and Daphne Ali. Okay, so we'll start with, first I would like the panel to kind of give a brief synopsis, and you guys will start with that, on that end. Give a brief synopsis of your view of the CSRA culture. Identify what you may think are some of the problems, and then start talking about ways that you believe we can impact those problems. Um, in the hip hop generation, which I was raised in, um, we tend to to ourselves. However, the biggest marketing tool is hip hop. Everything you see nationally now, they're using hip hop artists, hip hop music, and things like that. Um, so they're not, nationally, they're not blind to the fact that hip hop has an impact on our, on our youth. Um, so that, I think here in this area, that's the biggest thing that I've noticed is, um, you know, I think it's a lot of, you know, hip hop versus everything else. That's my, my take on it. Solution for me, um, I think if a lot more of us, people like myself and, and people that are here, if we all came together and started working together, um, I think that would be a start. I think we do a whole lot of talking and not a lot of walking. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's, an, any, that's anything in Augusta, not just the arts. Um, but I just, I think we, we have a lot of these, they're good. But I think we need to actually start putting some things into action instead of just, you know, coming together all the time, talking about let's do this, this is what the problem is, let's fix it. Well, let's fix it. Let's stop talking about it and actually act on it. I believe that children should be exposed to quality arts experiences that promote the development of positive life skills. Um, I'm also a dance educator and dance teacher for over 30 years. I'm also I've been in the public school system in the arts program for 11 years. I've been an uh, arts education director of the Arts Council. I helped found the Jesse Moore School of the Arts. And now I am uh, at the Art Factory. <laughs> um, from my perspective, um, our challenge is that truly the youth are not exposed. Our school systems do not support the arts. They are cutting it left and right front and back, and if you don't grow up with some sort of experience in the arts, then you're not going to go out and buy a ticket to the symphony or a play or anything like that. You're not going to even go there. Um, I think the issue um, of, of the hip hop versus the whatever, um, I think it harkens me back to my own youth when it was the long hairs versus the short hair. And so I think part of that is a sign of the times and some people just not understanding um, the wonderful possibilities of the hip hop culture and what's in there. And I think that's just a communication problem that I think has gone on since all of us rebelling against our parents and uh, understand what we were doing. As far as the solution, um, I think the most important thing that any of us can do is step out of our comfort and, um, and go, go to the movie theater, go to the symphony, go to these things, well, I'm going to do that. Um, in this town, people 
get locked up in their comfort zones and they don't have, they don't want to go out of there. Um, and so I think the arts community has a challenge to shake it up. And to do that, it would be wonderful for us to collaborate and do a collaborative event of some kind that involves all our disciplines, all colors, all styles, and invite the community so that the community comes to see all of us. Um, if I can say anything at all, it would be that in, within the arts community, there should be no color. It should just be artists, people making art, people in the I'm the communications director for the CSRA Arts Alliance, African American Arts Alliance. And, uh, and I really want to do what we were talking about, getting or what's been said before, is bring people out of their comfort zones to get to work together. Uh, because sometimes we just don't work together by proximity or by, uh, you know, we might think there's a language barrier, or some, you know, some cultural barrier, um, which, you know, is historical to this area. Uh, but, uh, but just like food, you know, you are what you eat, uh, you are what you, in media, you are what you watch, you are what you see, you are what you're exposed to. And uh, it's time for us to start feeding us a, a better, more balanced diet. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I want to I want to pull from the different pockets, from those different you know, factions, as I've called them, uh, in Augusta, so that we can come together and start creating a, a more rounded sound, uh, a more uh, diverse and, 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 and well-rounded audience. Uh, you know, we, we'll create that. We'll create our diet. Right there. We'll get it together. Uh, living in New York City for many years, so obviously the culture is very, very different. I'm, I am glad that there are avenues to be involved in. And just given the nature of some of my work, uh, I generally don't do children's type programming anyway. So I have found, especially with some of the work at Le Chat Noir, getting cast as everything having to be family friendly. Because some of the work we've done there has been more edgy, more original, more dark. And I feel like that's an important aspect. And at times getting adults involved, I have found with most dance studios here cater to kids. And I'm used to in New York, you know, there are lots of adult classes, so that may be a little different. And again, I'm not familiar with the school system, so it was coming in from that perspective. And for some people, the idea of a dancing company of adults is odd. And to me, it's like just bring the richness of an adult life enhances the interpretation of the movement. It's not just put some kids up there in cute costumes sort of thing. So in terms of my perspective, I think a lot more communication because I have really had to dig to find things. Um, fortunately, I'm willing to jump in and do projects. I've been coordinating quickies at Le Chat Noir, which is the now a venue for local authors to get their work staged, where first year it was more of a new faces kind of phenomenon, and then this year was a first year of all originals, and next year it's going to be a main stage production at the Chat Noir. But a lot of it is getting people out, also getting people to try things that they're not familiar with. And that's some of the conversations I had with some of my other theater people, or with some of the work I've done with Vista Theater as well, where we've done some more things that are much darker than some people think is appropriate. And then the same with the dance. I'm a Middle Eastern dancer. That means belly dancing. That means a flashy cabaret costume that shows some skin that more so than some people are used to seeing. So that I've had to do a lot, again, some explaining into, no, we are not strippers, we are Middle Eastern dancers, it is an art form. So getting beyond a lot of stereotypes and assumptions. I, I'm happy that there's events like Arts in the Heart, which the Greater Augusta Arts Council is putting on, and I'm, you know, thank you, Anthony, for opening this type of dialogue. I'm looking forward to meeting more of the arts community and getting involved with um, more people and continuing to grow our webs. And I think the other thing too is just finding venues can be very difficult. Finding affordable venues for some shows where the Imperial is horrendously expensive to rent, as I'm sure most of you know. Mm -hmm. And finding places to put on art where we also don't have to charge a lot of money. Because there have been times I wanted to go see something and it's like a forty dollar ticket price. A lot of people just have to think about it, especially if it's 
you know, you're a couple or, or child appropriate, you want to bring a whole family to something, $40 tickets can add up really fast. So finding ways of making it <coughs> affordable and in some ways maybe, uh, I'm not sure how some of these venues operate, but there's, there's a way where we can somehow get the money more to the artists and not just to middle people and promoters, I think, is important. Yes. Because a lot, it's like, there were things that I could do professionally there that, just, I've had to do a lot of stuff for free just to get myself out there here. And I'm not happy with it, but that's just, nobody's getting paid for a lot of things. So, how do we bridge some of those gaps and build more of an audience that, you know, maybe they can't afford Forty dollars, they can afford ten or fifteen to go see something. I decided to create an art organization in the last year, not knowing there are so many different art organizations in Augusta. And I think one reason um, there may be some division with the um, art scene, with the hip hop crowd, and what I like to call the other crowd. Um, is probably not an understanding of what each other is all about. And when there's understanding and there's actually dialogue, it seems to go a lot smoother. Some may have stereotypes about hip hop, some may have stereotypes about the other crowd, um, but mostly it's all about the art. And if you are an artist and you want to express what's inside and want to get your art out to an audience, it doesn't matter or should not matter uh, who is helping you or what avenue you decide to take. So I think as artists, we all need to have a true understanding of what each is about. And once we can get across those lines, we can develop repartee a dialogue and a relationship in Augusta because arts in Augusta is very, very diverse and I love the diversity because there's such a richness in it. You have artists that specialize in different types of art and to me I think it's just wonderful. But I really believe that once we get past some stereotypical things, I think that dialogue can be established and it is my hope that with meetings like this and with group gatherings that we can get past that. I look out in the audience and I see so many different people and different avenues of art that are represented here and I think that this is a great start and I thank you so much Anthony for trying to get it going. It's long overdue. I have been writing since I've been out of college which has been about seven years and I will tell you if it wasn't for Downtown Artist Row and a couple other art organizations, I would not be sitting up here. And you just have to reach out across the lines and just communicate with each other and just you know understand where each other is coming from. It's actually a great thing, and I hope that we can move forward with it in the future. There are a lot of projects here. People are poor. Crime rate is high. Poverty is high. I mean, let's talk about the reality of it. And I would like to see art use as a venue to help change uh, some of the things that are going on in the community. Uh, Cindy, I think you talked about positive life skills. Now, we can certainly use art uh, as a positive life skill to try to change some of the things that are going on in our community. Anthony alluded to some of the teenagers we see on First Friday going up and down Broad Street because they have nothing to do. Well, literally, you know, some of those teenagers have come up to us and said, I'm a writer. I'm a producer. I can play an instrument. Okay? And so what we've got to do is learn how to harness that talent as a group here. Uh, not just hip hop, but across all cultures. There are some teenagers who probably don't come down to Broad Street because they think it's so crowded and it might be a haven for trouble. But some of these kids are talented. So uh, my solution would be using art to try to change the cultural landscape here. Of course, we, we know that funding is almost depleted, so we're going to have to take individual effort uh, to, to try to make this better. And that's why I thank you for your time. You can't really say too many good things sometimes about the politics of South Carolina. Good. May I say that our legislature actually overrode yes. the governor's veto yes. to cut arts in our state. Yes. I mean, that was a groundbreaking stage. Congratulations.
Thank you. That was, but it was an alliance too between the arts and historical organizations because those cuts would start then on the state museum yeah. after it took out of the cultural arts. So, so we do work together hand in hand. And if I may, for two things for uh, Jezebella, did I pronounce it right? Yes. Thank you. My husband Larry over there, he's the chair of the Imperial Theater Board, so you might want to talk to him. And I just got back from Ontario, and they had the George Bernard Shaw Festival up there. They have, I believe, seven to ten concurrent plays over six months. I went to a matinee of Cat on the Hot Tin Roof, $90 a ticket. I have to thank my sister because she paid for the wedding. Wow. But it was packed. It was a matinee. Wow. $90. That was one show of one production for one day. It was packed. And I know with Larry at the Imperial and things we've done in Aiken that sometimes you just don't know what your audience is going to be because it's a last minute crowd as well. Getting back to when we moved here, we moved eight years ago from Atlanta. And I was told very politely and very bluntly that, oh, sweetie, Augustans don't cross the river to South Carolina. South Carolina doesn't cross the river to Augusta. And Aiken just, just like right there. And for the most part, I found that to be kind of true just because of misperceptions and, and silly reasons, basically. We had at the museum, we have a case where North Augusta history was given to the Augusta Museum because at one time the Aiken County Museum was perceived as Aiken only. And so North Augusta history was refused from the Aiken County Museum and it's at the Augusta Museum, go figure. It's just perplexing at times. For us in the museum field, with history and a generation of people who are so visual, who take their information in little bites, it's hard to equate a, what you might consider a static museum in a new generation, where I just saw the Enterprise Mill, you have an app you can download, and you can see what the Confederate powder works look like, even though the smokestack is the only thing that exists there now. And it's very, very interesting. We also are having a generation of people who don't collect things, who don't write things down. It's all digital. What are we in the museum field saying? What are we going to be archiving? So it's a very interesting dilemma on how to get kids and even young adults interested. Because ours is a, we always laugh, our board and our staff will all walk out the door together probably. We don't know who's going to come in the door. One of the companies that I was able to work with was the National Museum of Dance and Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, uh, which is not far from Albany. You know, which is three hours away from the city, 42nd Street, that everyone knows about, but no one knows about that museum. And my purpose is to bring my knowledge that I've gathered through traveling in New York, LA, the UK, um, all over Asia, specifically Seoul, South Korea, and Japan, bring that to this area. Um, and at the same time, absorb what's here, because a lot has changed in 11 years since I was here last. I own and I'm the founder and creator of Candy Fit, which is a workout system that helped me not get spinal surgery as many, many dancers and athletes sometimes find themselves need, you need surgery. And that word itself puts panic in, the, in the, the minds of those who need you. So I'm coming from the aesthetic of um, art, health, well-being can prevent a lot of illness. I come from a family where my mother had cancer, where several relatives had died of cancer, and I think a lot of that cancer was not just the physical cancer, but the emotional and the spiritual and the unsaid things that we really wanted to say. And so I hope that in this forum, we can say those things that we really want to say, um, have those uncomfortable conversations like I've had to have recently, and then get past that so we can work toward doing this together, because this is a collective, it's not just the Shire coming in late, mm -hmm. it's everyone else who's here. And so I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I think it's it's our responsibility as artists to be able to, to help people and, and show people and be that open-minded person. You know, I think that's what art has a lot to do with being open-minded and creative and figuring out new ways to, to help people, you know. Um, and that's kind of what I'd like to find a way to do, you know, using, me, using my pottery, how can I come out 
touch the community 